although the last retrospective didn't exactly do great things in terms of viewership, it's given me an itch to make more and to try and iterate and improve. So join me, if you will, on a journey to discover the history of the calculator watch. Merely a gimmick from a bygone age or an iconic piece of horology? We'll start by taking a brief look back through human history at the development of the first calculator and indeed the first watch before we get into the innovations that led to them being combined. We currently don't have a known origin of the dawn of mathematics, but the earliest written records we have of their use date from 3000 BC and have been found throughout Mesopotamia and Egypt. Around 500 years later, the earliest innovations in terms of technology to facilitate calculations began to appear. These were basic counting boards and then the abacus. It would be thousands of years until the widespread use of other devices for calculation emerged. In 1617, John Napier devised what he called his bones, a manually operated calculating device based on a lattice of multiplication tables that produced an accurate set of results. This wasn't quite the dawn of a calculator though, as in order to use them accurately, the user still needed to make some calculations of their own. What they really were was a shortcut to make multiplication and division simpler tasks. Using Napier's work, a group of English mathematicians led by a clergyman by the name of Reverend William Altred developed the slide rule. This tool allowed for more complicated functions and elements of trigonometry to be calculated. Now the definition for a computer is a machine that can carry out sequences of arithmetic or logical operations. So the slide rule is one of the first devices that can perform calculations and meets the bar for being a simple analog computer. Over the years, many different mathematical functions were adapted to be calculated through the use of different slide rules. As slide rules were so inexpensive, they remained a widely used tool until the advent of cheap electronic calculators in the 1970s. In 1642, after much trial and error, Blaise Pascal developed a device dubbed as the Pascaline to help his father carry out his work in the tax offices in the French city of Rouen on the banks of the River Seine. His device was capable of addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. And while there are very few of the devices left, they are nonetheless beautiful to behold, and much the same way as I can admire the inner mechanisms of a complex watch movement without fully understanding their operation, I will appreciate Pascal's work without trying to explain its working here today for the sake of brevity. Others took up Pascal's work, adding their own ideas and complexities to the idea of making maths easier for the masses. Gottfried Leibniz, a German polymath, spent his life studying across a number of fields, truly an academic jack of all trades. He's key to our story as during his lifetime he developed the Leibniz wheel, a key component to a device he would never see built to fruition during his lifetime. Over a hundred years after Leibniz's death, Thomas de Colmar produced the first mechanical calculator, the arithmometer, in 1820 that was seen to be dependable enough to be used in banks, insurance companies and government agencies. Over the next hundred years, mechanical calculators became more complex, more compact and were the go-to for office life until the late 1960s. The earliest valve and tube calculators lead us directly into the development of the first calculator watch, so we'll cover those developments later on. For now, let's look at the other key component in our retrospective, the watch. We won't start with the dawn of human history again. Instead, we'll look directly at the development of the first watch. Note here the term watch, which refers to any device that can be worn or carried by a person to tell the time. I make that distinction because the first watch looks unlike anything you would ever consider attaching to your wrist. Known as the Pomander watch of 1505, German inventor Peter Henlein is commonly given the distinction of having produced the first watch. There's no way to prove whether or not that's true. But what we can be more definitive of is that it's the oldest watch that still exists and is still operational. During the early part of the German Renaissance and the wider Northern European Renaissance, a number of clockmakers were working on projects to divide smaller, more portable and potentially wearable or at least carryable time-telling devices. Enline's device was contained in a copper pomander 
a device usually used for carrying perfumes to ward away bad smells. It's perhaps this protection afforded to it by the pomander that's helped it to stand the test of time. The pomander popped open, not to reveal a scent, but a watch face. The geek in me imagines trying to throw a pokeball and instead you're told the time. Watches, as they are today, became a symbol of prestige and luxury. They were typically worn as jewellery pieces or necklaces, but the quality of their timekeeping was questionable at best. For men, changes in style and dress created a demand for pocket watches, but women's watches were largely kept in necklace form as recently as the 20th century. I think the development of the internal components leading us to modern timekeeping devices that we have today would be its own lengthy video in and of itself, so I'll save that for another time. What I will say is that the wearing of watches on the wrist started with ladies' fashion, often featuring in bracelets and bangles. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century that wristwatches became more commonplace for men. Combat had changed dramatically and more and more strategic manoeuvres were being introduced. The need to accurately time an advance or retreat became a necessity. Trying to make use of a pocket watch while riding in a cavalry charge simply wasn't practical. This demand only increased through the two world wars until wearing a wristwatch had become commonplace in the 1940s and onwards. To understand the history of the genesis of calculator watches, really we need to begin with the first digital displays fitted to a watch, as this is an essential component without which they could not have been developed. In 1966, Stanley Kubrick made a request to the Hamilton Watch Company. He needed a futuristic watch to adorn the wrists of his astronauts for his science fiction epic 2001 A Space Odyssey. I've mentioned in the past wanting to make videos that focus on film. It's part of what I do for a living and something I'd like to think I have some expertise and insight on. Though granted, you might not think that from some of the dodgy camera work and editing on this channel. It's a little aside here, but 2001 is one of my favourite films of all time. It was so far ahead of its time and it's incredible how well it still holds up today. A cinematic masterpiece that if you haven't seen, you really should. I love being able to mention it here in a watch video and many people may not realise just how crucial the request made by Kubrick was to the watch industry. Hamilton obliged, creating a prop model known as the Hamilton X01. It's just one of many famous movie watches produced by the brand, but perhaps the most influential. It created an interest in the public for a futuristic computerised watch. John Berge, the head of Hamilton's digital division, set his team to work on meeting the public's demand. Hamilton were already known for the futuristic Ventura, which was the first electrically powered watch. So what better company to capitalise on the success of 2001? After all, it was their branding featured in the film. A prototype model was produced bearing the Hamilton branding, but the company wanted something more futuristic to match their innovation, and so the Pulsar range was born. That prototype watch, with a new branding, debuted on The Tonight Show in 1970. The display made use of an array of LEDs, and it was not only the first digital watch, but also the first watch with no moving parts. In the modern day, we might think of a digital watch as something rugged and inexpensive. This was not the case with the Pulsar. The display was fitted into an 18 karat gold case, featured prominent Pulsar branding and was said to cost $1,500 on the show. That is the equivalent of around $12,000 today, so this was not going to be something cheap to purchase. It did, however, capture the public's imagination. They had a space odyssey in cinemas, the Jetsons and Star Trek on TV, and these inspired thoughts that one day we might live in a world with futuristic technology, flying cars and robots to do our housework. This only fueled the demand for watches that were described as wrist computers. Hamilton worked with Electrodata to develop the components required and modelled their LED display using new technology from Hewlett Packard. The watch consisted of four main elements. The case with its integrated bracelet, a quartz crystal to keep accurate time, a rechargeable battery and the LED display. Years of research and development had gone into the watch by the time it launched to the public in 1972, 
and the price had soared to $2,100. That's around $15,000 in today's money. You would have been able to buy some of the very best models that Swiss watchmaking had to offer for less. Having said that, the watch still sold out and Hamilton was also producing much more affordable steel models that were proving to be extremely popular. The question from the public was, what next? In the 1960s, desktop sized digital calculators had been developed, with the first being the Comptometer, ANITA, launched in 1961, with the ANITA acronym standing for A New Inspiration to Arithmetic. Previous mechanical computerized hybrids had been experimented with, but the issue, as with the Pulsar, was proving to be cost. A mechanical calculator costed fractions of the computerized versions, and computers at the time were so prohibitively expensive they were not seen as a viable alternative for most use cases. Progress and innovation was rapid though, and a decade later, in 1971, the Busycom LE120A Handy launched in Japan, the world's first truly pocket-sized calculator. After the stratospheric success of the initial Pulsar launch, Hamilton set to work on innovating the capabilities of their wrist computers. Monica felt a little out of place as the original Pulsar line only told the time and was adjusted using a magnet. While it looked space age, it didn't really do that much to back up its title of wrist computer. So Hamilton partnered up with Time Computer Incorporated to help them fit something more substantial into their watches, a calculator. The space race of the 60s and early 70s had necessitated huge innovations in computing and miniaturization, and the electronics required to process calculation had become small enough to viably fit into a wristwatch. And so, in 1975, the first calculator watch was born. Once again, it proudly bore the Pulsar branding, and once again, it was launched on The Tonight Show. Again, it launched with an 18 karat gold model with a staggering price tag approaching $4,000. Accounting for inflation, that's nearly $23,000 in today's money. It was big and chunky, power hungry, and like the earlier Pulsar models, spent most of its time dormant to save power. But it was here. The world's first calculator watch dubbed the Pulsar 3822-2. You can see from the buttons it featured, it didn't offer a huge range of mathematical functions, but was nonetheless an impressive innovation of its time. The limelight did not last long though, and as quickly as it had risen, the Pulsar range soon faded into obscurity. Other brands were cashing in on futuristic technology, with Compucron and Sinclair releasing wrist-worn calculator models soon after the Pulsar. Not only that, but Texas Instruments had started to mass-produce LED watches on a scale that Hamilton couldn't hope to compete with. By 1976, you could purchase a digital watch for as little as $10. The idea of digital watches being expensive items was over, and the cost of calculator watches soon tumbled to follow. While the reign of Pulsar as the king of digital and calculator watches was over, it had already cemented its place in horological history. In 1978, the Pulsar brand was sold off to Seiko, where it remains to this day. That isn't quite the end of Hamilton's involvement, though. In 2020, they released the PSR, an upgraded, modernised and renamed for legal reasons version of their cult classic. It's perhaps fitting, given the origin of the Pulsar with 2001 A Space Odyssey, that they also released a version themed around The Matrix. Sadly, The Matrix Resurrections, a film so bad even Keanu couldn't save it. But given the film history of Hamilton and the digital nature of The Matrix universe, a marriage that does at least make sense. So where next in the calculator watch story? Well, when we think about calculator watches, there is surely only one brand and one design that really comes to mind. It's time to talk about Casio. In 1980, the first Casio calculator watch launched, the C80. This watch got Casio's foot in the door in terms of producing calculator watches, but really, it was their 1984 release, the Databank Telememo CD40, that really captured the mood of the moment. 
It was the pinnacle of geek chic and whose success led to the C-50, which famously appeared on the wrist of Marty McFly in Back to the Future. The CD-40 was a smartwatch before the term was coined, allowing wearers to store important phone numbers, set alarms, as well as offering stopwatch functionality, a world time mode, and of course, a calculator. Not only that, but its compact size and relatively sleek design meant it actually looked cool on wrist. Not cool in the sense of sleek, elegant and aesthetically pleasing, but cool as in cockpit of the Millennium Falcon and maybe one of the buttons would set off a laser cannon. Certainly, it would be more than enough to impress your friends in the playground or colleagues at the water cooler. To me though, the quintessential calculator watch and the one that I fondly remember from my childhood launched a year after I was born in 1988, the Casio CA53W. Perhaps the biggest compliment that I can pay to this watch is it's still being produced today. Not only that, but it's currently sold out. The CA53 is a successor to the C50 and makes a few improvements over that model. The strap is vented for better wearability and all of the primary colours are featured in its printed text. The watch is available in a wide range of colours and some fit really nicely into some other science fiction aesthetics but I think the original black variant is really the only option when it comes to that retro geek chic style that we discussed earlier. Let's have a look at the specifications of the watch to see if we can uncover what makes it such a versatile timeless classic. The calculator itself can operate with numbers up to eight digits in length, which you could argue is enough for most daily use case scenarios. It has stopwatch functionality that can run up to 24 hours, an automatically updating calendar, alarm features, and can show two time zones simultaneously. As a watch, it's also inherently wearable. Being rectangular obviously adjusts the wearing experience and the way we think about sizing. Coming in at 34mm across and only 8.2mm thick, this is a really nice wearing experience on wrist. At 24 grams in weight, it's lightweight and comfortable. It's something that you could forget you are even wearing. I think the truth at the heart of the matter though, as with many things in modern life, the unique selling point here now is nostalgia. Perhaps you wore one growing up in school or saw other kids wearing one and always liked the idea of owning one. Maybe you want to be transported to a time when life was a little simpler. It makes me feel ancient to pine for the early era of digital technology, but I'd far rather wear a Casio calculator watch than any modern smartwatch. I don't want to be constantly connected and monitored. I think it gets in the way of life, makes you worry about things that you simply shouldn't be, and stops you living in the present moment. I know I need to breathe, I can tell when I'm stressed or my blood pressure is rising. I don't want to be nagged to read my messages or to be notified by some spam email. Just leave me with my Casio so I can pretend I'm in Back to the Future, Star Wars or Blade Runner. Another significant appeal to me here for the Casio is the five year battery life. I loathe wearing smartwatches and partly that's down to me. I never ever remember to charge anything. I treat the time like an important coordinate. It tells me not where I need to be, but when. I cannot stand the idea of being late. It vexes me when I see how easily it comes to others. I need something that's going to consistently tell me the time and tell it accurately. And while the Casio might not be something that sees everyday wear, it does see everyday use. This is the watch that I use to set the time on my automatic or manual movements. Now I recognise I am biased. I love Casio. I have some of the Casio G-Shock models and a square model I wear to the gym and while swimming. Having said that, I truly believe it's impossible to go wrong with a CA53W. I'll try and explain with an analogy. When you think about having fun by going fast, power to weight is the biggest consideration. But the faster you want to go, the more expensive it gets. When you think about having fun with a watch, Surely one that you can write rude upside down messages on is a good place to start. I won't repeat the other capabilities of the watch, its wearing experience or my personal preferences, but what I would say is that it's a lot of watch for £30. Most iconic watches have a much steeper price tag than that. 
As for the data bank we discussed earlier, those are also still in production and have only become more advanced, featuring currency conversion, bigger screens and multiple language options, all wrapped in a package coming in under £40 with a stated battery life of an entire decade. Casio has a habit of this in its watches. It doesn't stop making them because they were cool and served a function when they first launched and still do today. On a side note, I think Casio would stack up really well against storied Swiss watchmakers if you were to rank them based solely on how many iconic models each has produced. I don't really want to discuss them in the video because as you've seen, I'm not a fan, but the rise of the modern smartwatch has put pay to the need to develop any further innovations when it comes to calculator watches. So you might get re-releases and new color options, but it's no longer an area that companies are looking to work on. In a lot of ways, the smartwatch is the ultimate expression of a wrist computer that was first dreamed of by audiences watching a space odyssey. But for me, they just leave me cold and can't possibly compete with the kitsch styling of a Casio calculator watch. I will make one small exception to that though, with the Apple Watch Ultra, because I can appreciate how it might be useful as a tool. I still don't want one, but I can see it has a real use case scenario at least. In a lot of ways, I think the rise and fall of the calculator watch mirrors mechanical and automatic watches. They were the king for a time, but became effectively obsolete in the face of quartz. They found a new home as a status symbol, and there's something about a tool crafted from parts that you can see and understand, gears, springs, and hands, that is testament to the skill it took to design and build in such a way that it can accurately tell the time. Calculator watches too are now effectively obsolete. When your smartwatch is effectively a small PC, how can such a simple device hope to compete? At the moment, nostalgia and a longing for a more analog life are perhaps the key drivers to its sales. In a world where everything is slowly becoming more homogenized, many people already argue they have no need for any kind of watch. They can check the time on their phones. A growing number of people in younger generations cannot tell the time from a clock or watch face. It may well be that all watches are becoming obsolete. All the more reason then, as a fan of horology, to support and enjoy these technologies of the past before they fade from time and memory. As ever, thank you for your time watching the video. If you enjoyed the content, consider dropping the video a like and subscribing if you'd like to see more.